Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. This is the Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 workshop of the town of Scarborough, Maine. Uh, today's workshop topic is the report out for the downtown committees uh, from the downtown committee. And then at seven o'clock, we will start our regular meeting. If we do not use the entire hour and a half today, that is fine. We will simply take a break and enjoy ourselves before we come back at seven. Uh, so some quick background, I'll in introduce uh, our guests today and then I will promptly hand it over to them. Uh, sitting across from us today is Art Dillon, Brian Shumway and Travis Kennedy. All three of these gentlemen were on our downtown committee and about, I believe January of this year, we formed a downtown committee, which consists of nine residents of Scarborough, which I believe we had approximately 40 people apply. So of those 40 people that applied, we selected nine as a council. And also on that meeting were representatives from um, Crossroad Holdings, our town staff, and then we had uh, Councilor Anderson and Councilor Clucci as our council representatives through the entire process. They met with some pretty high frequency. I'll let Travis probably uh, expand on that a little bit, but there, the original plan was to be done, I believe in June. I think we all understood that the task was larger and needed some more attention. So we're grateful not only for your time, but for the extra time you guys spent on this project. And we've been waiting for the report for the last couple of weeks and we have it. And so now we've dedicated an hour and a half to uh, have you guys give us a presentation and then hopefully just have a nice productive Q&A session afterwards and help everybody uh, better understand the work of the committee. So with that, Travis, did you want me to control the presentation or do you want to control it? Or? That, that would be great if, okay. if you wouldn't yeah. mind clicking is, through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Is it the same one that's in the packet? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let me just bear with me for one second. And it's not the most conducive for PowerPoint, so we'll do our I've best to good with talk. PDFs, making yeah. them look like PowerPoints. I'm getting really good at it. So. <laughs> You want to start with this part? Yeah, sure. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I want to do my best to get you all that little break between our portion uh, and your meeting tonight. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't start with a lot of gratitude. Um, I want to thank you all for forming the downtown committee, for nominating us and for giving us the space to explore this project. Um, Brian and Art, I, I want to thank these guys for coming out tonight. I know that some other members are watching at home and may join us uh, for Q&A later. So I, I wanna thank every member of the committee who gave up every other Tuesday for the better part of a year um, to work on this project. I wanna thank uh, Dan and Rocky and the guys at Crossroads who participated from the start, who, who never brought us a, a prescribed agenda and who uh, were, were just great sources of information for the entire process. John and John uh, are two council liaisons. Same exact thing, the, the guys were there to answer questions, to offer feedback, to offer guidance, uh, but at no point to, to try and steer us in any particular direction. Um, from staff, Tom Hall was with us every single meeting. Uh, he kept us pointed forward. He kept reminding us of what was and was not within our charge. Uh, and her name, uh, uh, I think uh, criminally is not on this report. Uh, Karen Martin from SEDCO came on board at about the halfway point of our process and really supercharged the direction of our efforts. She kept us focused. She kept us uh, thinking about what our finished product needed to look like. She provided an enormous amount of information. So without all of those people, uh, we wouldn't have been able to produce this for you tonight. So thank you all. Uh, thank you everybody who's listening, who was part of this process. It was something that um, certainly took longer than I think we expected. Uh, we started with maybe more of a, a blank canvas than we expected, but I'm really pleased that we stuck together, that we worked uh, longer than we were originally scheduled, um, because I think that the finished document reflects a lot of important work that hopefully you all can now take uh, and work with uh, the, the developers and other, uh, other entities within the town over the next several years to, to make a really, uh, I think, exciting um, generational project work in, in Scarborough Downs. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, we started meeting in January. We met every other Tuesday, uh, really straight through September. I think we, we only really took one break in the middle of summer during that time. Otherwise we met twice a month uh, for about an hour and a half um, for nine months. And you may remember uh, in June, we came to you and asked for more time. 
And the reason that we did that is because um, we had spent a few months doing a lot of research, giving a lot of feedback to Crossroads. And then to their credit, they went and hired a developer to redraw their map based on what we had told them. And it made a lot of sense to us to continue working when that new map based on our feedback was prepared so we could give more specific feedback on where the project had moved based on where we directed them so far. So in June, we were presented with a new model for the downtown. I know you've all seen it. Uh, I think it's been presented to you and it's also in our report. It reflects a lot of the things that we talked about in our meetings. Uh, and from that point on, we use that as a basis to prepare this final report. So with all that said, uh, here we are. Uh, we're presenting to you our finished report. Um, it, it, it's broken down into uh, five sections, I believe. The first one is background on why we exist. That is information that none of you need. You formed us in the first place, but we suspect you're not mm -hmm. our only audience for the report. We think that we'll probably have a fair amount of interest from Scarborough residents who want to know what we've been up to. So we provided the backstory of what brought us together. Um, and then we moved into, uh, I'm just going to kind of flip through while I look at it, but you don't need to click through, yeah. Mr. Chair. I yeah. just want to give sure. sort of a summary. Um, after that, we were presented uh, uh, with what existed currently by Crossroads and what their current plans uh, based on winter 2021 were for the downtown. Um, all of that information is in here as background as well. And then we, uh, we started to talk about what were the major elements that we knew we were going to need strong recommendations on. And right, right from the beginning, we knew that uh, what you end up doing with the grandstand or what the Crossroads ends up doing with the grandstand is critical. So our report contains, um, uh, what you'll see it in the appendices, a pretty thorough report formed by a subcommittee uh, of the bigger committee Brian was on that subcommittee um, where they discussed what they wanted to do with the grandstand and what they thought its possibilities might be. There was a time in the spring where it looked like the library might be interested. So the committee did a lot of work on that. Um, but they also uh, more broadly considered if the grandstand is, is maintained, what should be done with it? And so that report is in here as well. Uh, we had another committee that produced enough material that it was its own appendix. And Brian was on that committee as well. That's why I, I really am glad that he's able to be here tonight. He may end up fielding a lot of your questions tonight, um, which is that committee was we called the modeling committee and they studied other, com other uh, communities that have gone through this similar process in the last 20 years or so. New downtowns, new developments that meet a lot of the same goals that we're trying to meet here. And in some cases, they talked to the people who built them in the first place. They talked to the people who maintain them. They asked a lot of great pro probing questions. And the report that I think they produced is just phenomenal as a guide for what they've discovered works in other places across America that have taken on uh, this kind of process. So uh, that's in there too. We included the new design that, um, that uh, Crossroads worked with their contractor Goody Clancy on. We included uh, in advance of that design, what we called our visioning project, where at about three months in, we took a break and we said, what do we all think is important in this to, to have in this downtown? None of us are downtown designers, but we were all selected by you for one reason or another. And we wanted to make sure that everybody's reason for wanting to be on this committee had a chance to be aired. And what we discovered is that there were a lot of universal ideas among us that everybody agreed to. The most uh, significant one being that the center of the downtown should have some sort of uh, central space where people can converge, where people can collide, uh, a village green or a, a town square, something smaller than a park, but bigger than a parking lot. Um, that would serve as the central location for the downtown that's ringed with commerce. You'll see in your materials, um, uh, one of the later append appendices, we provided the full list of everything that we had uh, discussed and that came out of uh, that exercise that led immediately into our presentation from Goody Clancy. Those materials are in here as well. Uh, their new design for the downtown, which I'm sure is going to continue to grow and change over the, over the next several months, but 
it was a phenomenal response, I thought, to what the committee gave to them. Um, and then finally, uh, we talked about what are some of the nuts and bolts that we think you all and the town and the developers are going to need to figure out now that our work is done. Um, you'll notice that there are some uh, design recommendations about uh, the density of the downtown, about controlling speed on the main thoroughfare that runs by, uh, by that village green. And we also talked a lot about the necessity of a permanent and constant relationship between the community and the developers. Who's going to manage the, the site to make sure that it remains uh, a community feature and not a private one? Who's going to be responsible for programming there? Who's gonna schedule uh, everything from, um, from farmer's markets to, uh, to concerts and you name it? I think we have a volunteer to do all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, my, my wife is on the way to pick them up. Um, <laughs> we're, we're short one counselor, just pull it right up. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, as you all maybe are aware, my, my daughter Ella in the back was our most frequent commenter. Yeah. Uh, she, she offered several useful ideas. Um, so that's our process and that's our report. And I, I guess I would ask for, maybe I would ask if Brian and Art want to chime in before we move into each section and talk about the experiences and what they want to make sure that we get across. Now, I, I thought it was a great experience. It was a great group to work with. Um, it, it, it was many hands um, getting the job done. And as Travis alluded to, we broke down into subcommittees. We did a lot of work. Uh, a few of us were on multiple committees. And um, I think the reports that came out were very good. And I'm sure you've seen them open to questions and that's my experience i thought it was great other than having to do a lot of it remote <laughs> um, which was an interesting way to do it yeah I, i'd echo that uh, you know it was a it was a great varied group of people with uh with varying perspectives varying uh experience sets and you know and i really appreciated how we uh we seem to take you know, both a physical and an operational and a public purpose uh, perspective um, in, in the various things that we looked at. So um, you know, I think as you guys assembled us uh, and set the charge, uh, it was really clever. And, and I hope that it was useful um, you know, to town council and also to the developers uh, as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks again. I think, you know, I think in the packet, there's the 18 page initial report. I think for members of the public, it's posted on the website. There's additional 230 pages of appendency and accompanying information. So if you are out there and this is something that you get into, I, I encourage you to go onto the website because you can really take a deep dive. Uh, great high level report, but the meat, the meat is there. Um, it's just for simplicity. We have just the high level report here. Um, but again, thank you everybody for doing it. I know what this is like. It's very time consuming. And when it's essentially twice as long as we expected, we, we have twice the appreciation. Uh, so with that, I think what we'll do is I'll just kind of go through every counselor and they'll just keep the floor until they've done with their discussion. And we'll just kind of run, run the gamut, so to speak. And I will probably start at that end of the table since you two gentlemen were part of the whole process. So Councillor Johnson, do you have any questions that you have on hand? I really don't have questions. I want to thank you for the work. I've read the report a couple of times. So a lot of moving pieces, greatly presented, especially when you just pull it all together. And I love the, the mime around the grandstand having history and moving it uh, to the future. The way it was expressed was pretty good. So again, I want to thank you for the work. Definitely going to be rereading and maybe we can do some follow-up questions sometime. So. Councilor Caterina? Uh, I don't have any questions per se. I do want to thank you very much for your work. Um, so that's a lot to, to handle, I know. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that it, it went well for people in the group and your assistant sitting back there. Um, I, I'm going to bring it up just because I know it's hanging out there and that's that a thousand units supposedly that um, the the uh, developers are saying they need in order to make this vital or, or work better and I was curious if that was discussed 
in your committee? Uh, uh, would you like? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yes, yeah. Like, it took up, uh, it took up, I think, two full <coughs> meetings and about a half of a third one. Um, we uh, we had the those numbers presented to us. We had the explanation for for why uh, the developers and their consultants landed on those numbers. What we ended up determining is that we agree in general that they're probably going to need to make some adjustments to the design of, of the downs to bring more density to the downtown. Not more units, just more units closer together. <clears throat> We're not qualified to decide on a number, which is why we didn't offer one. We did recognize that based on <clears throat> largely on the discovery of the modeling committee and what they found in other communities, density is important to a successful downtown in order for it to be operational after business hours, in order for the smaller businesses, restaurants, and so on to be successful. Density is important. So we recognize that in our report. And we also recognize that functionally, it's hard to build density slow. And so you may want to consider allowing some of that density to be built at a higher rate, at a faster rate. Again, not more houses, just maybe constructed a little bit faster. That's as far as we were willing to go as far as recommendations. But we did understand and recognize that the argument holds water. Uh, and so that, that was after a lot of discussion, we started very specific in, in adopting that thousand units number and the length of time. And the more we talked about it, the more we, we realized we're just not capable, the nine of us, of deciding what that number is and that time period is, but we recognize that you all might need to spend a little more time thinking about it uh, and working with Crossroads to come up, up with an appropriate number. Uh, that was the extent of our recommendations on that counselor. It was what we felt comfortable recommending to you. Okay. Did, was there a discussion <clears throat> at all regarding, when you say density, that means a lot of different things depending on who's mm -hmm. looking at it. Um, as a real estate professional, to me, density is a number of potentially smaller units in a smaller area. Um, and of course, my thing I would love to see more of is, is the retail uh, restaurant, whatever, with office and, and perhaps apartments or condos above. Mm -hmm. So it's all compacted. Um, is that something that the committee discussed or is that or am I jumping yeah no, I, I mean a lot of that was in the presentation from Goody Clancy uh and recommendations that we got from Kamoy who was the <laughs> consultant that uh Crossroads brought in to talk about density specifically it's hard to do it any other way uh we recognize that single family units are not a good idea I think that that made it into the final report um density in a downtown means being able to walk uh to the downtown within five minutes and it's hard to do that unless you're going small and tall. Uh, and that's what sort of brought us to realize that if they're, if they're gonna do it, they're building probably large buildings with, with several units in them at once, mm -hmm. um, which is largely why we, why we uh, address the time, timeline. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the short answer is it was the bulk of our conversation. What does density look like? How do you do it? Uh, and you probably do it with a lot more single bedroom units uh, above retail, above office space. Okay. Um, and then I apologize because I have not had time to delve into the, all the sub reports. Mm -hmm. um, but um, was there discussion regarding the set aside, the land that's supposed to be set aside for municipal use and how that could be used and or um, any way a school, one of the this consolidated school potentially could be located in the downs, or again, I may be jumping ahead or whatever. Yeah. I was just curious whether you guys discussed that at all. We didn't discuss which parcel specifically. Right. Uh, we did discuss in concept where some municipal space could be used. One of the things, maybe I'll ask Brian to talk a little more about it, that the modeling committee determined is that some municipal presence is critical and it's a successful downtown. It existed, I think, in, in every model that you looked at. Um, so maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, what you all learned about municipal presence and mm -hmm. And what we talked about it. Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, 
it, you know, one of the one of the consistent you know elements of these you know model downtowns, uh, as we as we called it, we called it our world tour. Right, so we we all went looking at different examples of this in in other parts of the country. Uh, it was civic uses, you know, throughout these developments, um, and you know, part of part of that was to create uh, you know a consistent user that was reliable, right? And so you know, civic users are reliable and they're there for the long term. Um, they also generate a lot of foot traffic, right? And, and foot traffic is good for you know, for commerce and for you know economic vitality. Um, and so we we talked about you know the presence. We talked about the balance. Uh, and you know we also talked about the the fact that you know there is a uh, sort of a tax uh, you know reduction when a civic user is using space, um, and probably there's you know an economic impact on the landowner. Uh, who you know likely is not going to be able to charge the market rate uh, for the use of that land, right? So there's there's a balance, and so um, you know as we talked about civic uses, um, you know whether it's a school or whether it's you know, even a post office or you know some annex to a library, um, we talked about you know what you know how nice that would be and, and all the good about it, but also balance those discussions with um, you know the realities that uh, you know it's not it's not all rainbows and unicorns when it comes to civic uses. Right. And, and then my uh, last question is, because I'm known for this, <laughs> I guess what I'm going to ask about, <coughs> is workforce housing and affordable housing. Because I know, again, and I brought this up over the past number of years, um, I'm most familiar with Daniel Island in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a planned community. It's a big one. Um, and they have everything from Section 8 all the way up through workforce housing uh, mixed in quite successfully um, with, you know, and plus you've got multi-million dollar houses um, right down the street type of thing. So I was just wondering if that was discussed by this committee. How are you gonna, how we can- uh... it, it was not in significant depth again, because it None of us were experts in it, mm -hmm. but we did talk about, especially in particular, as we talked about that density discussion, the smaller units in the downtown, right. how important it is that people who are working in the downtown are able to afford to live there. Right. So it was a it was a recommendation that it be taken seriously. Um, but again, we're, you know, getting into uh, uh, income levels and, and number of affordable units versus uh, versus market rate, it wasn't something that we were comfortable wading into beyond saying, please do it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, one one of the benefits that we had, you know, we walked into this knowing that there's the the requirement to include ten percent of the units as affordable by definition. Um, yeah, so in a way that was sort of taken care of you know, with, without our input. Um, and we sort of had the disbenefit of, uh, you know, we all are starting to become aware of the concept of workforce housing and we're all generally excited about it. Um, but you know, as a town, we, we're not quite there with having policy or even having definition around it. So it was, uh, you know, we're still just we're kind of on the van, that, on the vanguard right? about that. We're going to fix that, uh, right? right? We're, we are going to fix that. <laughs> the downtown uh, committee is not going to fix that. <laughs> Others no, will. Others will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so you know, it's an important concept. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, by its by its nature, you know, we hope that with all of that housing, yeah. it, it will remain uh, attainable. Right. Um, and uh, you know, I, I will say with with the the density discussion. Um, you know, I think density brings up different ideas to different people, but it means one thing, right? It's it's units per acre, um, and you know you've approved a certain number of units throughout that entire development. And if you think of it as you know a giant pile of Legos, you can either spread them out all over the table, or you can kind of bring them in a little bit closer. And and that's that, that was kind of a pivotal thing that we began to understand was um, you know the you know, Camoin and and Crossroads wasn't talking about adding more Legos to the table. They were really just talking about, you know, how high we can take the stacks of what's already been approved for the area. And, and that I think was pretty eye-opening for us as a committee um, and kind of let down our guard a little bit as we were having the discussion. Um, and, and that was really important to us. And I think uh, as a council, I think as you're thinking about things, uh, we'll make the conversations more productive. And I just want to point out to the public that when they're talking about high building high, we're not talking about skyscrapers. 
Because I do know there are people out there who think that that's tree scrapers. Mm -hmm. They're tree, tree scrapers. scrapers. <laughs> yeah, but I just want to make sure the public understands that. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Hamill. Thank you. Thanks uh, to the committee and uh, and the folks that participated. That was a that was a giant uh, body of work, and you you all acquitted yourselves uh, really terrific terrifically in terms of that chore and being flexible and powering through that work over nine months plus. So thank you for that. Um, and I think that your your summary and the content of the entire recommend the entire package, the entire report is really a great piece of work. So thank you. Uh, I promised myself and also uh, Chairman Johnson and the town manager that I wouldn't get into a lot of discussion about housing units. So I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you. as much as I, <laughs> but uh, I think we'll have another time to talk about that. Uh, I what I'd like to to know though is uh, you know what you envision in terms of process and next steps. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be one and done in terms of this meeting. You know, being the you know the be all and end all in terms of us receiving the report and then feeling as though it's ready to implement. So I'd be. I'd, I'm eager to hear what you think about timing and process for next steps. Yeah, I think um, I think that what we ended up discovering by the end of our work was that we spent about nine months preparing for several years of work to be done. Um, our committee's charge is complete. We don't exist anymore after tonight. Uh, it doesn't mean that I think all of us uh, are not interested in continuing to work <coughs> with you, but I think that the, the principal message at the end of the report is that a permanent structure needs to continue to exist that takes into account all of the elements of Scarborough government, which will have a hand in developing the downtown, uh, and of course the developers themselves from here on out. I, our committee um, shouldn't exist forever, but something like it probably should. Uh, that's made up mostly of, of, of you all and of members of the planning board and SEDCO uh, and everybody who's going to be involved in this should continue to have, I think, a permanent scheduled conversation about where you go next. What we started as was a committee that came up with a list of recommendations of things that we thought we'd like to see there. What we were so impressed with was what came back to us in physical form and then from Goody Clancy. And then we really started to talk about what we thought about it, but what we don't have answers to, and what I think you all may not have answers to for some time is, what is the town's investment in this? Do you wanna own a piece of the grandstand to make sure that it has public access forever? How does edge sports complex and potential municipal involvement in that affect what happens in the downtown? How wide are the sidewalks? Who's cleaning them? Uh, the, the Goody Clancy model currently has them flat. You want them raised. Um, I think that you have a lot of questions that are left to be answered. And hopefully what we've given you is a, is a structure to begin to look at them. But this feels like the beginning of, of this work, not the end of it. Uh, and I think um, our responsibility now is to hand it over to the experts. Uh, so we hope that what comes out of this is either a permanent super committee or a permanent schedule of regular meetings to discuss these things as they start to get closer to fruition. Um, we, we went four months extra and this is all of the information that, that, that is current, uh, but it's still only a beginning. I hope that answers your question, Councillor. Um, I, I think that our hope is that we're handing this off to, to <clears throat> you all in a permanent way. Great, I appreciate uh, that input and I think we've had good success getting our arms around big chunks of work this past year. So I think we'll, yeah, we'll look forward to putting our heads together and trying to figure out what that looks like and what the time frame is for that. In closing, for my part here, I just uh, I wanted to reflect on what has happened since we were here maybe three years ago. I went back uh, and looked at some recordings of presentations and that sort of thing that we were doing back when we were just pitching the concept of the downs in the first place. Um, three years ago about this time. And if we look back now, I think it is without question that the, the of the three phases, the clearly the residential and the innovation phases have been huge successes. I think the replacement, IDEX coming on the scene as a replacement for, for WEX is, is very promising. I think that those things 
are, are very confidence inspiring. What I, it's real, I think the success, however, is gonna turn around precisely the center of, of the downs and that's gonna be the, you know, the downtown district and what look and feel it has. And I really liked the conversation we had, however briefly about density. So I think that those, you know, those questions are not gonna be so much about number of units. They're gonna be questions about um, timing and, and, and how much and how fast. And I would just tell you for, for one person, um, my feeling is that we, if, if we really are at a point where we need to get some scores on the board in terms of uh, retail, in terms of amenities. Um, and I know there's a big debate about what comes first, the people, you know, the, the density of the residential units versus the, you know, the retail part of it. But um, I, I think we need to get on the ground um, in several places in the downtown, including the grandstand with some very specific recommendations with timing. Yeah, and, and I mean, to that point, a conversation that we had a bunch of times is, how do you build this so it feels like a downtown once you start building it? And not that it feels like a downtown seven or eight years down the road when it's, when it's all built out. And so I do think that it, it was one of the recommendations in the report, which is, how, how is it built in phases so there's something to go to once they begin to develop that, that village square area? So it's not, like you say, it's, it's not um, just one element at a time. Uh, and how does it feel like it's something next year or the year after and not at the end of the road? It's not for us to solve, but I do think that uh, we have some confidence meeting with these guys that they're thinking about it. Uh, and hearing that you're thinking about it now, uh, you know, makes me feel good about mm. seeing that phase in happen in a way that feels like there's something to go to for, for the rest of us. So I'm encouraged by your, your enthusiasm about that and the energy about that. And I think that that will cover, you know, many constituencies in town as we, as we move to the next step. So thanks. Yeah. Just if I could uh, add on to the next step uh, explanation, uh, you know, practically speaking, the next step is really for the Downs team to make application to the planning board for uh, master plan approval. Uh, they've done that in all the prior phases and they'll be required to do that in this phase. So this report in some part, uh, hopefully is a resource document for the planning board as they receive that information. The one thing that I was really struck with is that this process was intended to be collaborative and it was actually collaborative. And I think <coughs> what we've been able to do over the course of the last nine months mm -hmm. is to help not change their thinking, but inform their thinking. And so what we hope is that what they submit to the planning board, uh, you know, has uh, different elements, if not all of these elements incorporated in one way or another. So that's kind of the next practical step that happens. Uh, and then of course, uh, there's subsequent uh, site plan approvals and subdivision and so forth that's required, but really the master plan is the next step. And I don't know exactly the timing of that. I suspect it's in the fairly near future in the coming months. Uh, but that's likely to be the kind of the next kickoff. And uh, so hopefully this is a planning document that's gonna help the planning board in that review and analysis and discussion. And then also it's thought provoking for the council because there's some, there's some extra work we've got to do beyond this. Uh, we're certainly not done. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hamill. Uh, Travis, I really appreciate your insight of keeping of having some sort of body as we continue. I 100% I, I agree. I think that we need some sort of meeting place, meeting of the mind, so to speak, that's consistent and last for the next, let's say five, six years as we see ourselves through this process. So completely agree. Uh, Brian, I have a question for you. I think it's for you. Um, the management of the site really struck me. Did, did, Cause you were the, the head of the modeling committee, right? So did you find a model that worked better than most or is there one that was a disaster that, or, you know, cause that is, that's a really good question. If we're going to mix all these municipal uses in with this private development and what, what worked, did you find one that worked in, yeah, in retrospect that some people think it was going to work and it fell apart? Is there any fun stories behind that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Not for public consumption. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you must've got yeah. an earful from somebody. Right? So, um, I'd say our, our takeaway was just the importance of planning for management, um, for, for acknowledging that this is a private development. Um, it's a private development with, with a, a huge public impact um, you know, that the public cares a lot about and, um, and that you know, a, a, kind of a, a mangled and, 
and uncoordinated management of this very big, important space um, is very likely to be disastrous, yeah. right? So, um, you know, articulating what's important to, to us as a town, you know, from a public perspective, and, and making sure that that's addressed is is pretty critical. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's who's cleaning the sidewalks, uh, who's taking away the trash, you know, there's a public bathroom, who's cleaning it, right? right. Who's operating it? Um, you know, all of these very like detailed, boring things that matter to the user experience. Um, we we just highlighted those as uh, really important, which became kind of a surprise for us as we you know all came to the committee initially. Um, you know, a little bit thinking, you know, what's thinking this is a little bit about, you know, what's your wish list for fun things in the downtown, right? Right, right. So, you know, it's like, you know, do you want park benches or Ferris wheels, right? Um, but then we started talking about things like management of space. And, um, and, and so it was, uh, it was an interesting discussion. Was there any discussion of a lazy river or was that? <laughs> no lazy river, but no. we had a pretty interesting discussion of Ferris wheels versus <laughs> merry go rounds and... <laughs> we, we did look at several for sale carousels. I know this is in your report, Travis, but can you just speak a little bit more in depth to the, you said a quote, which I think is interesting. And I, and I understand most of the rationale behind it, but I think it's worth talking a little bit more about the park versus a park, not as big as a park, but not as small as a parking lot. Right. Because I think when, I believe the green space I think we're kicking around is somewhere approximately an acre. And I believe Memorial Park, Tom, is Memorial Park five acres or? Okay, so right, so as a resident, right, I look at Memorial Park, which I think all of us are collectively very proud of it. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. park, right? And so I'm, and I'm, I'm visualizing something the eighth of size Memorial Park, right? Of course, we're not trying to put a memorial park in the downtown, and that's something that we would need to communicate out. But can you just speak to, you know, why, why, just, why quote, just an acre? And, sure, yeah. yeah. And it's funny. I mean, we started a meeting with that exact question. If you wouldn't mind, Mr. Chair, I think it's page 10 of the report. You can see an overhead map of, uh, of the new model that shows that village green in the center. We spent a lot of time talking about how absolutely critical to the success and the, and the success uh, perceived by Scarborough uh, of the downtown is based on that village green or that town square or whatever form and title it ends up taking. We all started, I think, with that idea of a smaller park in the center. And when Goody Clancy came back to us and said, an acre is appropriate. We all kind of had the same reaction, just an acre. That doesn't make sense. Um, what I, I know I know Art did, what I did, what Brian did is we all went out in the real world and seeked out park spaces. Councillor Anderson did as well um, to get a sense of what that acre feels like. Uh, I work in the Cumberland County Courthouse directly across from Lincoln Park, which is a little bit bigger than an acre, but not much. My office is, I'm in a four-story building. There's sidewalk, vertical parking, a road, and then this park. And it's a significant amount of space out my window across to the other side. So the first thing we did, I think, was, was disabuse ourselves of the notion that an acre is small based on what we're hoping to use it for. And also that it won't feel crowded upon uh, if the design, which as you can see on the map, shows it uh, ringed by road and sidewalks and potentially dining space. Um, it feels bigger than an acre. What we talked about a lot about is what's the purpose of this central space? And if it's not a central park, and if it's not a Deering Oaks Park, if it's a collision space, getting much bigger than an acre. And I went out and walked around Lincoln Park. I found a park in, uh, in a town in York County. I forget which one. It's a little bit closer to this size. And I just walked around them and I imagined looking across uh, the, the park at a, at a restaurant or a shopping center, trying to find my kids while they're running around. This, the idea of it being a collision space and not a park, of it being a village green, demands something smaller. It means that if I say, hey, Brian, let's meet up uh, in the downtown after work to grab dinner, we can spot each other a lot easier across an acre than we could across a two, two acre or three acre park. The, the purpose of it is not to be a park, we have Memorial Park, we love Memorial Park. Um, the purpose of it is to be a meeting space. And so that actually also led into a secondary conversation that you'll find in the report, which is just how critical it is that we find ways to connect the downtown to Oak Hill, 
to make Memorial Park not feel like a different part of town. So the large events, the, uh, the, the recreational events that you're going to go to Memorial Park for don't feel so separate from the downtown because the, our, our vision for that green in the downtown is that it's not a park, that it's a, that it's a collision space. Um, that it's a place where no matter where you are in the downtown, you can see what's happening on the other side. Good, thank you. Memorial Park does feel isolated, right? It does, it's more of a- In, in a wonderful way, right. uh, but they're serving two very different purposes. Yep. Yep. And, I, and I think also because, you know, the design has the edge sports complex and playing fields on the outside, so <laughs> under the current model, so long as that moves forward, there's a lot of green space around. Um, the, this is, is less about being green space, more about being a center of town. Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Great. First, I just wanna thank you, Travis, for, for your role as chair, because you did a phenomenal job guiding this group and team throughout this process. So thank you so much for, for all of your hard work and to all the committee members who participated. You know, I, going into this, like you mentioned at the beginning, I think everybody was, was taken aback a, a little bit at the blank canvas that was put in front of in front of you guys. And I know it was really easy, Brian, like you said, to kind of go down the path of, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a Chipotle or, or something <laughs> like that down there? Um, and I think there was, that was kind of where the group started. And it took some time, I think, to find the, how do we establish a vision or, or something that can be a launch pad? And I think that was really complex to, to try and do that because, you know, people immediately want to go to like, what do they want there as opposed to how do we make this a space for Scarborough? And how do we not, you know, be too directive to the developer to give them some leeway in terms of, you know, leveraging the market to, to bring in what, what would actually make the space that vibrant place for people to come and play and, and do what they want to do. So um, I think that was that was great to see through your leadership and through the committee's discussions and actions how we got here. And I want to thank Rocky and Dan um, for the role they played as well. You know, Dan especially, you you made yourself available and committed a lot of time to this committee. And I know they had a lot of questions for you and you were always available and responsive. So I appreciated that. Um, and I, I also think bringing in Goody Clancy, like you guys did at your own cost to really help take a lot of the views and vision that came from this group who, as you mentioned, aren't experts in downtown design, but, but really represented the residents and the needs of the community, you know, really well to give to them to kind of take that and really finish painting that canvas that, that was blank so that we really do have a really great launch pad to start future conversations from. So I wanna thank the Downs, I wanna thank the, the committee. Things that I'm really excited about that came out of this was, was maintaining the grandstand, but also how it could potentially be reimagined and be built into that bigger village green space so that we kind of preserve some of the old Scarborough, but but really modernize it to meet the needs of the growing community. So I thought that's something that's really excited to explore. And I think that will be a great anchor space or a potential municipal space that could really help bring the community together. So again, I'm just really excited about the next steps and continuing the dialogue and the conversation to really kind of turn this into something for the planning board to get it and, and, and work further on, on you know, making this actually happen because I think a lot of us are actually really looking forward to that play piece and and you know we want to we want to see that stuff come to the town so that we can all gather you know there's been a lot of conversation lately I think especially with the the turf and track about how there aren't many places in the community to gather with that kind of being one of them and I think everybody's really hungry for that place where we can all go and like you said make those connections see see our neighbors see our friends and really just enjoy each other and enjoy the community. So I'm really looking forward to this going from paper to actually, you know, being built and, and something that we can all enjoy as soon as possible. So thank you guys all for your hard work. Thank you, Rocky and Dan. Thank you, Tom, for, for your leadership as well. You were like, like Travis said, you were just as available as, as anybody to try and answer our questions and pull people into the conversation and Karen, especially coming in at the end, like you mentioned, she really, I think helped to kind of, you know, after being working on this for, for so many months, there we needed that fresh eye to come in and really kind of move things along. And I think Karen just was was a hero at the end. So thank you to everybody that was involved. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Councilor Kuchi. Yeah, obviously, <clears throat> thank you everybody for all the work that's gone into this. I mean, 
I'm thinking back a couple of years ago when the original vision for the downtown was created or depicted, it was a massive green space with some residential on the side and a community center and maybe a couple other buildings. Um, it, 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 wasn't, it hadn't been formulated or thought through all that deeply. Um, I think where you've taken us with this process and with the developer's help is a mile down the road, right? There's still nothing that's actually being built but I think we're a lot closer to having something practical that could actually happen. And it's uh, a really unique opportunity where you know, a lot of cities or towns already have an urban area that they might talk about creating a park or creating a building. And you're talking about creating the whole thing. And to do that all at once is a, is a massive undertaking. But I think you might have the blueprint, what Goody Clancy was able to you know, help formulate, um, is a picture of what it might look like at the end of the day so that maybe you can start taking bites. And, and putting a building here or there um, and, and putting people down there, right? So we know residential is important, but you know, a lot of people don't build retail with residential on top anymore. Um, it's more risky. It, so it, that's something that excites me about this space as, as well as the greens and the, the grandstand. Um, you know, there's a lot of history and character there. I got a tour uh, with the developers and um, there's good and bad, but it, it's a part of us. And um, it's what makes, a, it, it adds character. It's what makes us part, you know, unique. It's also extremely difficult to make work financially, right? It, it's an old structure. It needs a lot of help. And there's not a lot of apparent end users ready, ready to take that on. Um, so that's where, you know, maybe we need to create some partnerships between the town to, to try to figure some of that stuff out. But I think where you've taken us in, you know, the past nine months is from, a very blurry vision to something that's a little more crystallized that isn't quite there yet. Um, we can't force somebody to build something, and uh, but we can help and encourage it or incentivize it. And, um, that, that's where I see our our role, I guess, <coughs> pivoting to now is um, using what you've provided and what the developer is willing to do to help try to narrow the focus. Um, and I do think that what you've come up with and what with the developer's help and Goody Clancy is a good fit for Scarborough. Um, it's, uh, I guess, I don't know what the right word for pedestrian scale. It's, it's we're not building a Boston here, right? We're, we're building another neighborhood within Scarborough that could benefit the overall community. Um, so I, I did want to ask a couple of questions and, and if, you know, you've kind of been deep into this stuff for a while now and some of you for longer. What's the, something that maybe surprised you or, um, you know, sticks with you that you, you may not have expected going in that, oh, you know what, this is something that's pretty important for Scarborough's downtown. I was, I was excited once I heard about the sale of the property. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I felt I could see a lot of this vision that they also had and as it was presented and their phase one and phase two have just kind of really impressed me beyond what I was expecting. So getting to the, the phase three or center portion of this, um, I, I just am more in, excited about. It's gonna take time. There's a lot of more meetings to go through, um, but I, I think the partnership has been very good and there is no reason for it not to stay that way. Um, it's a great piece of land, great people to work with. Um, they've got so much invested, they're, they're Scarborough people. <laughs> they want to succeed. They want this to work. And I, I just, I can't wait. I want to invest <laughs> <laughs> when it gets a little closer. Uh, I, I guess for my part, what I what I found myself almost stunned by was we had this committee of of different uh, you know people from different walks of life and and different experiences. And the more we talked about our vision, the more I realized we all had almost an identical picture in our heads. I, I mean, when we did that visioning exercise we were all describing the same thing from a different angle. And I went back afterward and I went and I read through 
uh, all of the collective material that was done before this that led up to this. And they're describing the same stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we're in a unique place where everybody in Scarborough to some degree sees an image of the downtown that is very similar to each other. And there may be some variations, but even, you know, even when the guys came back with that imaging of the grandstand with, with half of the, half of the building cut off, but the coverage still there, um, you know, it's, it's something that was existed in my brain before I saw it. So I think um, what I learned from the process is that the energy in this town is in, in, in a phenomenal place and in such a similar place. And so long as we can capture it and so long as the work that the town does from here on out along with crossroads to bring it together, I think it's gonna look like we all want it to look like. And, and I was almost stunned by that, just hearing the same descriptions come out of, of everybody in the committee's mouth uh, and seeing what, uh, the town is identified as what's lacking and what they want to see. It's just all, it, it's all so clear. Um, and, and I was pleasantly surprised by that. Awesome. <clears throat> you know, there, there are a couple of takeaways for me. Um, you know, one, two of them are sort of related. W one was the importance for not, importance of not planning for this five minutes. Right? So we're in, in really the importance of everybody acknowledging we're in a really, really weird time right now. Um, and, and we're, we're planning a development that hopefully is going to last a really, really long time. Um, so if, if we're planning something that involves wearing masks for the rest of our lives and standing 50 feet apart from each other, um, that's probably a mistake, right? So hopefully the world will change. And so 10 years out when this whole thing is built out, um, we, we should be planning for that and building for that. And uh, that that was a little counterintuitive. And you know, six months ago when we were starting our discussions, that was hard for us to wrap our minds around. But, but I think it was really important that that was the right lens to think about this development through. Um, the other thing which, which I think we succeeded with and it was really important was not to, uh, not to be overly prescriptive, um, but, be, you know, but to give useful input. Right? So your, your Chipotle example, I think is a really good one, Councilor Anderson. You know, um, we figured out uh, maybe not too early on, but you know, our job was not to program the downs but rather to you know, describe what about whatever program came up would uh, make us you know, happy citizens, right? And, and so uh, you know, that I think is what you'll hopefully see you know, in the report. Um, yeah, and, and so I, you know, I think those, those were my you know, biggest takeaways. Thank you. I, <clears throat> like uh, Chairman Johnson, I really enjoyed reading some of the appendices that the, the, the subcommittee work that was done was really ph phenomenal. Um, is well researched, is detailed, um, and it really helps to paint a good picture. So, thank you guys. Thank you all for for everything. And now the you know, the trick is going to be figure out what's next. Mr. Chair, I do think I saw one of our committee members was in the queue when you pulled it up. Yep, sure. Uh, Kim Kim Rand was on our committee, so if if um, if you don't mind, I would love for her to answer those that question. Kim, do you, if you want to raise your hand, I'll how about Kim? You raise your hand if you want to say anything. Oh, <laughs> she does. There we go. Kim, your, uh, your camera will not be on, but we'll be able to hear you, so go ahead. Oh, thank goodness the camera's not gonna be on. Um, can oh, you hear me okay? Hold on. Looks like the sound might be off. On it does, hold on, Kim, I muted you. <laughs> Kim, can you start again? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah, go ahead. I just said, thank God the camera's not on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I kind of echo uh, a couple of different things, but, I think we did we did all kind of start off at a really really um, fine grain level. Like we were we were ready to pick out paint colors for everything, <laughs> and I think that um, through the process we we knew we had to come up and and that was a that was it was a, it was it took us a while to get there. Um, so it was it was a really great process. It was a really a really really good team um, and. I, I also think about what Brian just said about we can't design for COVID. We have to kind of think um, further than that. Um, and I also have to throw in a caveat. I actually live at the Downs. Um, I was in some of the phase one um, development and everybody I talk to that's, that lives here because we walk the property all the time is, is so excited about this, this whole thing. Cause I've, you know, I've kind of conveyed, you know, what we've talked about, um, what we were thinking about, that it's a meeting place and, you know, 
where people want to gather. And it was, it was really um, reassuring to know that the whole, that what we were doing and what we were, we were talking about um, is what people are really looking for, um, especially the ones that are living here now. Um, the other surprise, well, not surprise, but the other thing that concerns me the most is the connectivity on that eastern side of the development. Um, so that, that gap between Sawyer Road, Memorial Park, um, and that kind of thing. That's one thing that it was, we, we talked about it at, at great lengths. Um, we couldn't, so we can't solve it, but we just, we, we, we know it's an issue. Um, other than that, it was really, really a great experience and I appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. I'm gonna turn you off now. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, just to my take on reiterate where we are. So everybody to for the public and for us, uh, we have a lot of parallel tracks going. And I think this has been extremely helpful um, because the tracks have been parallel. There's a little bit of friction to figure out what the next steps are doing this. I, we have been pretty adamant that we wanted to hear from you guys before any next steps were taken. And to me, this uh, assured me we made the right decision. So thank you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for the report. Um, as uh, excuse me, Tom Hall mentioned, at some point the Downs folks will probably ask for some sort of exemption or some sort of approval for next year's uh, GMO. Uh, they've reached out to us over email about two or three times in the last couple of months, and we have said, please don't until we hear from you guys. Um, and that's exactly what's happened. And so I appreciate the Downs holding their gunpowder, so to speak, and I appreciate uh, you guys coming today. So there's that track that's going on. There's also another track that we've started that we're all pretty excited about. We're looking to bring in some sort of consultant or agent that will help us navigate these waters. Uh, we had an abridged workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago that essentially we had a uh, scope of work that was very large. We worked on uh, whittling it down. The town manager has gra graciously offered to, <laughs> to revise it for us. Uh, but just so the public knows and so everybody knows that we are trying to get somebody to help navigate. I think one of the common things you guys have said is how much a consultant helped you. So that assures me that we're doing the right thing, trying to get a consultant for us to help us through the process. Uh, so we have those two parallel tracks going. And to me, this is just me personally speaking, but right now I'm the chair, so I get to for the next month or so. <laughs> the third parallel track would be to, to perhaps consider a standing committee to, to perhaps work with a consultant that we're looking for that, that sees this process through for the next year to three to four to five years. So I think if, if you're at home just tuning in, just realize there's a lot of moving parts. I think what tonight does is it starts putting those, those tracks are still parallel, but we're at least moving in the same direction. And I think before there was some friction there simply because of timeline, timelines not matching up. So um, just speaking for me, and I think for some of my counselors, tremendously helpful. It allows some clarity around the situation. We have a ton of work to do, a ton. Um, and this is just the beginning, but I think now I feel a little bit better of at least how we're going about it. So um, with that, I'll open up public comment. Does anybody want to speak before I end the workshop today? Okay, seeing none, we will adjourn and we'll come back here in a half hour for our regular town council meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
Okay, good evening, everybody. This is the Wednesday, October 20th, 2021, regular town council meeting for the town of Scarborough, Maine. First is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is roll call. Councilor Cucci? Here. Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. And Chairman Johnson? Here. Thank you. Item number four is general public comments for anything that is not on the agenda. Are there any general public comments? It's okay. You can take it off. Sure. Yep. It's ultimately up to you, really. So, yeah. <laughs> My name's David Green. I live at 135 Beach Ridge Road. Uh, I, I want to talk about something that happened a while back that nobody has addressed, at least to my satisfaction. All right. And it has to do with the vandalism down over the hill. It did 25,000 somewhere around damage. How and why did that occur? Okay, I can tell you why, because there wasn't one of those on the gate. That cost $11.59 over here at the hardware store. Now, do we not have one? Or was somebody not responsible enough to put it on there? I, I would love to hear an explanation for that. Okay, because it hasn't been forthcoming. And what you have been forthcoming with is you want $1.9 million to go redo the field down there. And I haven't heard one issue about security down there. So is somebody going to be responsible enough? I, I would think with all you people sitting here, it's kind of your job to look out for us taxpayers. Okay? And, and why somebody hasn't asked a couple of tough questions as to how that happened I'm not looking to point the finger at anybody, but how are you going to move forward with a 1.9 field that you, you don't have a security plan? Who's, who's responsible? Okay, that's my question. All right. The, no, nobody's put out, oh, we're, we're going to have automatic locks on the gate. For 1.9, it ought to be self locking. Okay. And I'm not arguing the price of that. I'll let the Taxpayers Association do that. They did a very good job of why you shouldn't be voting for it. And I, I find it, it it's tough for the kids. And I feel sorry for them, okay? But I'm going to recommend to everybody that they don't vote for this until somebody steps up the plate and tells us what happened to start with and assure us that it's not going to again. Anybody like to take a stab at it, go right ahead. Mr. Green, I'll stop you right there. Mr. Hall, would you like to give an explanation? Because there is a huge misconception about the vandalism at the track. And I think this is an opportune time to clear it up. Yeah, to the issue of the vandalism, forgive me, I don't recall exactly when it occurred, but it was shortly before the last vote. Um, there were uh, three juveniles, as I recall, that uh, entered illegally onto the turf field in the evening, uh, had some fun uh, doing donuts and other other behavior with the vehicle. Uh, we did work through the district attorney's office, uh, sought re uh, restitution. I believe we have received restitution as was directed by the courts. Um, I don't believe it was in full uh, and, and we have to defer to the DA's decision in that regard. In terms of security, we do have certainly uh, gated access onto that field for maintenance purposes. Uh, as I sit here, I can't say that they all have locks uh, if you go check them tonight. Um, but I, I think the, I'm not sure if that would have uh, curbed the behavior that uh, caused the vandalism three years ago. Uh, if someone is, is destined to create havoc, I, I think they'll find a way to do that. Uh, but I can certainly raise the issue with, uh, with my staff and with school staff in terms of uh, putting, putting uh, uh, locks on those gates. But I think for practical maintenance reasons, we do need to have vehicle access onto that turf area. And so there'll be openings big enough to, for a vehicle to, to go through. Um, but I'll certainly follow up to see if they are, you know, have a padlocks on each of them. And does the bond issue have anything to do with the vandalism since? No, it was just coincidental. It happened uh, the months leading up to the last uh, referendum question. 
the condition of the field, uh, you know, we did repair it based on the vandalism, but the need for replacement has nothing to do with the vandalism that occurred. I broke protocol there a little bit, Mr. Green, but I know you like to try to get answers, so I'm trying to give you an answer. Yeah, so. that's that's fine. Yeah. But uh, we just heard from the town manager that, that he don't care if there's a lock on that gate or not, whether it's overnight. Or, you're just asking for trouble. Why why can't somebody put a lock on a gate? Why? You got all kinds of people in community services. You got maintenance people. Last guy out walks the gate, but you have no policy. Okay, and I believe that falls on you, Mr. Hall. Okay. As I sit here, there, for all I know, there are padlocks in every one of those gates. I'm not going to assert that there are or there aren't. Uh, I will certainly look into this. I would think after what happened three years ago that you'd be able to sit here and tell us, looking at a $1.9 million bond to have a new field to let the same thing happen to. Please step up the plate, have a little security. That, that falls on you, I do believe, okay? And it also falls on these people for letting you get away with it. We're going to end the back and forth. So is that it? Or? No, no, okay. no, I don't okay. want to go back and forth. I just wish people would step up the plate and be responsible. Fair enough. It's our tax money. Thank you. Fair enough. Any other public comment? No, I guess I would encourage anybody that's watching is spend a little less time on Facebook and spend a little more time reading the hours and hours of work that we put into the Scarborough Leader, which is a newspaper and not social media, and consider informing yourself as much as you can. With that, is there any other public comments? Nope. Okay. Uh, item number five is the <coughs> approval of the minutes of October 6, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, Tony? Councilor Gucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman yes. Thank you. Item number seven is items to be signed treasurer warrants, which I already have. Uh, item number eight is the town manager's report. Mr. Hall? Yes, just a few brief uh, items tonight. Um, today we concluded uh, the second round interviews. This is the second time through for police chief uh, candidates. Uh, Councilor Clucci is kind enough to, to join us. Uh, we did, as I've said in the past, mirror the same process uh, as before. Uh, that involves a focus group of kind of the, the patrol division and a sampling of the department uh, uh, about an hour with the command crew in a, in a full tour of the station. So these candidates are with us for about five hours, uh, start to finish. Uh, so thankfully we did complete that today. We'll do some further deliberations for the follow-up. Uh, and I'm quite hopeful that I do have a, a police chief in that candidate pool, very pleased with, with the process and the product, I think. Um, I think as soon as next week, we'll be in a position to perhaps extend an offer. So pleased to give you that update. I also want to make the public and the council aware, uh, the council, excuse me, the town was made aware uh, late last week about, uh, these are really class action lawsuits that being uh, uh, occurring at the national level. These are against uh, big pharmaceutical companies uh, and small ones, frankly, uh, regarding uh, opioids and, and a potential settlement for ill effects on uh, public health uh, at the state level and also local level. Uh, our state uh, um, has joined into that class action and really by virtue of that, we have an option uh, to be involved directly as well. Uh, I briefed council leadership uh, on this uh, earlier today. I did have a quick consult with uh, town legal counsel uh, who indicates that it's not uh, terribly onerous on us. Uh, frankly, if we were to pursue this on our own, it would certainly be, uh, but we can kind of tag along on these cases. I mentioned that just, uh, it's something that I, I think, you know, this town in particular has taken a, a keen interest in uh, really on the recovery side of things. And I think we'd be wise to perhaps join into the suit. So I'm gonna do further research uh, it may require, and, and if we wish to pursue this, I will be looking for the council to provide authorization for me to file the necessary paperwork. But based on first uh, first blush, it, it looks as though it's something uh, that does not require much of any effort, certainly a little or no cost. And for that reason alone, I think it's something we ought to consider. So look on an upcoming agenda and I hope to uh, bring that as soon as next meeting. Also, I wanted to update the council and the public uh, uh, the Scarborough River and our mooring fields uh, down at Pine Point is, is an official um, 
uh, navigation area for which uh, the federal government through the Army Corps of Engineers uh, needs to assure that there's safe navigation, uh, at least in the channel uh, into uh, uh, up the river and into our mooring area. Uh, there's no guarantee, but generally it's on a 10 year dredge cycle or so. Uh, we've actually experienced uh, some uh, pretty accelerated uh, movement of sand and shoaling occurring way at the mouth of the river, as far out as the uh, Prudsonek Yacht Club actually. Uh, very pleased the Army Corps was very responsive uh, about a week and a half ago. They did have their survey boat uh, here. Uh, they actually, through sonar and other methods, do a full uh, you know, test the topography of the, of the channel and have determined what we know to be true, uh, which is there's been really serious shelling that's occurred such that it's, uh, it's almost an urgent situation. So. I don't have a definitive answer uh, you know, when and how much dredging will occur, but I'm very pleased that the Army Corps is fully engaged uh, a number of folks, uh, including our Harbor Master and folks on the uh, uh, Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee uh, are actively engaged in this. Uh, I did share with Councilor Hamill as a liaison to, the, to that group, a copy of the dredge survey, and I'm pleased to share that out with the council. So uh, no promises, but I'm hopeful we'll get some action sooner than later. Um, I can't expect that it would happen this fall, but uh, perhaps in the spring we can, we can look for that and I'll provide further updates. Uh, lastly, a matter on your agenda this, uh, this evening is uh, having the council officially accept uh, first half or a portion of the, of the ARPA monies. Uh, these are fiscal relief monies uh, and I'll certainly provide more context at the time. Uh, but I, I've received a number of inquiries from community groups in terms of whether the, the town's going to entertain any outside groups. Uh, we're, I just want to provide a general comment. We're undertaking a kind of an internal process with staff. We want to bring that probably through finance and then to the full council. So the action on uh, the table tonight is simply to receive the funds. Uh, I think the action includes a promise that we'll come back and need to receive subsequent approvals and authorization from council to actually spend it. Um, so we need to do this to really meet um, and comply with the guidelines. I suspect part of the process that we'll, we'll recommend is perhaps an open process to the community in terms of other ways to spend these monies other than just internal. Um, but that remains to be seen. We really wanna kind of go through the internal process first to see what's left over, if you will. Uh, so I just wanna make that mention uh, really to those that have reached out and inquired about kind of where we stand. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, available for questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Seeing none, we will move on to our business. Order number 21086 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 311, the Town of Scarborough Schedules of Fees. Um, before Mr. J. Chase says anything, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this? It is a public hearing first. Nope. Jay, you want to give us a brief overview before we take second reading? Schedule really actually are part and parcel of action under, I believe it's old business, which are amendments to chapter 405 to allow for utility scale solar energy systems. Um, as part of that process, there will be additional burden on staff and planning board for review. So we want to be sure we captured um, the, the, the costs of doing business, so to speak. Um, and so that's what the fee structure is intended to do. If you need more than that, I'm happy to provide more details. Thank you, sir. Do we need more than that? No? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? No? Tony, you want to call the vote? Councilor Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 21087 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and a second reading on the proposed new chapter 420, the Town of Scarborough Temporary Authorization of Outdoor Services. Before we have Tom talk to us about this, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak? No, Mr. Hall, you want to just refresh this? I know it's pretty straightforward from yes. we've done this a few times. Yes, this is an action that actually creates an ordinance to replace the emergency ordinance the council I had in place prior. This really allows the continuation of extended outdoor services uh, in light of the fact that we're still in a pandemic situation. 
It also recognizes that businesses may want to continue these uh, you know, beyond. Uh, this action uh, actually uh, allows these, these activities to continue through, I believe it's May of next year. Through, yes, through May of 2022. Uh, and again, that's just really just uh, to give uh, notice and time for businesses to either make application to planning board to modify their site plans as may be necessary. Uh, and again, I think it recognizes that we're still in a situation that uh, it requires it. I guess the final anecdotal note I'll make, uh, I've not received any concern or complaint from residents or otherwise that these activities uh, are bothersome or, or hazardous at all. I think uh, I've heard from many of you that you've all uh, seen them, enjoyed them, and uh, and hopefully we'll tolerate them for another six months or so, uh, and we may see them long term. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. Any questions for Tom? No. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, I just wanted to say I was happy to see that we've done this. I know I forget who it was, Portland or someone had some brouhaha over there. Is I guess going away and having to bring them back, whatever. But I, I find that I think the more flexibility we can give to businesses right now, uh, the better. So I'm happy to support this. Tony? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 21090 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action to determine whether the building structure owned by the descendants of Nathan F. Hoar and Dorothy M. Hoar by virtue of the warranty deed dated on November 1st, 1967 and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, book 3018, page 381 and located at 83 Holmes Road and further on the current tax maps of the town of Scarborough on file in the town office as tax map R020 lot eight of the current Scarborough tax map is dangerous and a nuisance within the meaning of the title 17 MRSA 2851 and order any appropriate corrective action. Uh, before we begin, I'll just lay out the process here. This is a, uh, a process we just we don't do too often here in public. So number one will be an evidentiary part of this uh, process, which will have town staff present to us the evidence that would uh, support that the building is, should be deemed dangerous. Number two, any prop, any property owner or heir or anybody that has an interest in this property will be allowed to speak up at that podium right there. And number three, we'll then receive a quick brief by the attorney that's representing the council, actually not staff, but representing the council, Zach Brandwine, who is sitting over here to our left. He'll give us a quick uh, rundown of what is expected of us. And then number four, we will deliberate like as at normal and take a, a final vote on this. So one will be evidentiary hearing where we can ask a couple of questions if we need to. Two will be any interested party in this property can come speak at the podium. Three will be evidence from our attorney, and then four will be our deliberation. So with that, uh, Mr. Longstaff, do you want me to pull up your presentation? Uh, sure. Okay. So Brian Longstaff, our head code enforcement officer, is going to speak. Um, so uh, I've distributed a, just a quick PowerPoint just to kind of basically show some photos and go over what we've done to date um, and how this, how, how we came to be here tonight. Um, it's a dangerous building action as, as uh, previously described. The history of it, which I, I know you've all received uh, uh, on or about uh, November 7th, Chief Thurlow uh, reported that there had been a structure fire at that subject address um, and alerted me that the building was in very bad condition um, subsequent or actually prior to the fire. <laughs> but also because of the fire and asked if I would do an inspection to determine whether it was habitable or not. So on November 10th, I did uh, an inspection of the exterior. I wasn't able to gain entry. The doors were locked and I did not have uh, access to them. So I did do an exterior um, inspection and determined that just based on the exterior condition of the building, I would post that building against occupancy, at least for the immediate future until uh, I could gain entry inside and do a further inspection, which I did on November 18th. And uh, there were several fire department personnel there to assist. Um, we did determine in fact that the conditions inside the building were very, very bad. Um, 
in on January 15th, um, we also did another interior inspection with the assistant town manager at the time to um, see if there was any hope for possible rehab. He was looking at resources outside of the, the family to determine if there might be some way to rehab it. We again determined that was a pretty, pretty um, bleak um, prospect. On June 2nd, um, I was alerted by uh, some of the folks that were lending social service assistance to the family that the temporary housing was ending. Um, we just took some stopgap measures to kind of quickly board out very lightly board up the, the structure just just to make sure that they didn't migrate back and and try to try to to um, habitate there uh, and then on july 9th we met with legal counsel to initiate the dangerous building procedures as uh, as you had mentioned under 17 mrs subsection 2851 um, i had provided an inspection report uh based on the interior inspection on january 18 uh, excuse me on november 18th uh, the dwelling was in very poor uh, condition from the fire to damage, as well as age and years of neglect. Uh, there were a lot of things in that structure that didn't just happen. It had happened after, a, you know, over a long period of time. Um, the building frame certainly showed signs of, of fatigue and failure in certain places, sloped floors, ceilings were bowed, walls were not plumb. Uh, we couldn't even identify the foundation. I, I still don't know what the building was actually sitting on. I believe it was probably mud sills. The building is listed as 1900s vintage uh, by the assessor's office. We, we don't have any records. Um, it, it's that old. Um, it's sinking slowly into the earth, um, as you'll see in some of the photos. Uh, we observed a lot of water damage, some due to the fire, some not, some due to plumbing failures, um, charred ceiling joists is damaged, electric, electrical wiring. Uh, the dwelling uh, was very filthy, very unsanitary, a lot of pet waste, um, a lot of clutter, um, just a lot of animal infestation droppings, those kinds of things. It was, it was not good. Um, the photos that you're about to see really don't provide a complete picture of it. You really have to be there to experience. There's a lot of sensory things, elements that are left out of photographs. Uh, you can't feel the floors flex beneath your feet through photos. Um, you can't smell or get a sense of the, the plumbness of the walls. You can't really see all the little signs that this is really a, a poor building in, in very poor condition and, and had been for some time. Um, just to remind the council, the dangerous building standard um, really just charges you to a judge whether the building is a nuisance or dangerous. Uh, and I highlighted in red, you know, structurally unsafe, unstable, or unsanitary, or constitutes a hazard to health or safety because of inadequate maintenance, dilapidation, or obsolescence. Um, that's really the primary task that's before you tonight. And I hopefully can, can demonstrate that to you, but obviously it's your decision as to whether or not this meets that standard. Um, so the first uh, series of photos show you, um, you know, some kind of insulated sheathing material on the exterior wall of the kitchen, um, likely to keep pipes from freezing during the winter. It's probably pretty drafty. That whole section of the building is actually pulling away from the main section of the building um, at, at a severe angle. Um, the well appears to have some kind of a pump run by an extension cord. You can see the orange cord running across the ground from the house to the well in the, in the rear of the structure. That's not obviously to code. It's not a safe situation. It was probably a stopgap measure to, to be able to draw water from the well. Um, animal burrowings under the structure. I'll show you more photos of that uh, in, in, in coming slides. Uh, again, no, no real observable foundation under this structure. It's really literally sort of sitting on the earth. Um, the next slide, the next page. Um, you can see the inside of the kitchen wall, uh, cabinet doors can't even close because it's so tilted. Everything is pulling away from the structure. The plumbing is totally messed up and probably letting sewer gas back into the dwelling because it's not vented properly, not connected to a venting system very pro you know, properly. And the ceiling in the kitchen was, that you see on the, the far right hand uh, photo is not the result of the fire. That's not a result of water coming in from the fire. That was in a totally different area of the house. That's a plumbing uh, failure upstairs. 
uh, that's caused that. And that didn't happen overnight. That, that's been there a while. Um, on the next page, again, just some photos trying to demonstrate some of the unsanitary conditions uh, in the house, uh, pet waste, um, in the middle photo. Uh, we observed several gallon jugs of empty jugs that I assume were there to help flush the toilet and do some other, other things. The plumbing obviously not working correctly. And that is above that, that big ceiling burst uh, below it that you saw in the previous slides. Um, on the next page, uh, this is where the fire occurred. This is in an upstairs bedroom uh, towards the east end of the structure. Um, it, it just made us aware of the conditions in the rest of the building. This is actually the least, really the least serious part of the building was caused by the fire. But it does, it does sort of inform us that there's probably some electrical issues within the structure that will, you know, would again result in, in similar um, circumstances. Um, the next slide just shows, again, some of the, the, the sloped roofs on the porch. Um, I also took the photo to demonstrate that I had posted it. You can see the red placards in both the side and the front of the porch. Um, always uh, need to do that just to demonstrate that we did, in fact, placard the building. Uh, the next slide uh, shows some of the exterior conditions. You can see some of the sloping ridge lines in the left, left photo, as well as on the front of the building, which is the, the right photo. Uh, you can see the eave going one way and the peak going the other. That's structural fatigue, undersized uh, framing members, and just uh, you know, just just poor poor building construction and age uh, over time. In the next photo, I tried to, to to demonstrate where we could not identify any kind of a foundation under the structure. I don't know why that middle photo is tipped sideways. That's odd. They're not that way on my slides. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But uh, as you look at, as you look at, you can see the animal burrowing under each one of those photos and really no visible means of, of, um, of support from the foundation. On the next slide, uh, that is so odd. Why did it do that? Because mine are, mine are right. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're all sideways. Um, again, that was the room, the one on the left is the room where the fire occurred, just giving a kind of more, more holistic uh, view of that. The well pump, that orange cord that ran out to the well is wired into the circuit panel, the entrance panel, which is not, not a code compliant condition and very unsafe. Uh, and then just a, a photo to kind of demonstrate the general um, filth and condition of the structure, which was pervasive throughout. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Any questions for Mr. Longstaff? Okay, I see none. Um, Mr. Hall, do you have anything to add before I go to other comments? Only to the extent that uh, I think what the zoning officer has done is, is trying to establish the, uh, at least it educates you and uh, your determination of whether the building is dangerous or a nuisance uh, from a, uh, practical point of view, what we're here seeking authority to do would be up to and including demolition of the structure. Having said that, uh, my intention would certainly not be to take that step immediately. Uh, I view this as really an opportunity to take kind of progressive action. Uh, I would envision our first action would be uh, perhaps you wish to allow the homeowner to have some period of time to cure a situation. That's an option to you. Uh, if it's left to us, I think we'd look to secure the structure a little more um, stoutly, if you will, uh, really around uh, first floor entrances and first floor windows and such. Uh, this situation, as I understand it, uh, is uh, the subject or will be the subject of a probate situation. Uh, we did our best through the uh, town attorney to make sure that all known heirs and possible heirs were aware of this proceeding. Uh, I'd feel much more comfortable if those folks could be identified and we could have discussions with them in terms of their uh, abilities, expectations for the property. And so, um, you know, that's another reason that I really want to go slow with this to allow that process to unfold and for us to fully understand interested parties uh, legally and otherwise in the property. So I guess I just wanted the council to have the assurance and anyone at home uh, that our interest is not to simply move in and raise the structure immediately. It's to uh, work with uh, interested parties, um, legally interested parties, and uh, uh, first and foremost, secure the structure, make sure no one gets hurt. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, we will close the evidentiary part of the hearing. Is there anybody here that's an interested party in the property that would like to speak? Anybody? Seeing none, I will note that we do have one handwritten uh, letter in our possession that is from one of the people that is currently residing in at the property. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Brandwine, do you want to give us a pre brief synopsis of what we're going to do? And then we'll do it. Absolutely. So thank you. Just for the record, I'll identify myself. I'm Zach Brandwine. I'm counsel for town in this matter. Um, the first thing um, you should all do is, is just have a brief discussion amongst yourselves about uh, whether you think the building is dangerous or not. If you think the building is dangerous, um, I would just ask you to identify for the order that you will, I will draft for you and that you will, you will enter um, a couple of points of evidence that you heard supporting why you think the building is dangerous. Uh, again, that's only if you think the building is dangerous. Uh, after that, um, uh, we should call a vote uh, on whether the building is dangerous or not under the statute. If you determine that the building is dangerous, um, I will take direction from you about what you want done, what you want ordered in the order um, from uh, everything from um, what the town manager mentioned, which is immediately securing the building against entry up to and including possible demolition. Um, I'll advise you a little bit at that stage about um, some best practices in the order, such as allowing 30 days at a minimum for the property owner to comply um, and, and bring the buildings sort of into compliance um, themselves. And uh, finally, um, uh, I, uh, I, like I said, I'll draft the order for you and um, you can delegate to the chair the authority to sign the written order, which will then be recorded in the registry of deeds. And then we will serve that written order on all of the heirs that we've identified and posted again in the newspaper. Okay. So there's a lot, we can take yep. piece by piece, but- That makes sense. Thing. For simplicity, I think I'm just gonna go down the line, state whether you think it's dangerous or not, and point to a piece of evidence or two if you believe it's dangerous. So with that, Councilor Kluge. Um, yeah, I think you know, clearly the code enforcement officer posted it as unsafe almost a year ago. Um, it doesn't appear that the condition has improved at all in, in that time, maybe even gotten a little worse. Um, it's clearly some unsafe conditions. Um, so I, 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 you know, with that question, I, I don't think it's safe for somebody to be occupying that space as a living quarter right now. Okay. So you're going with, you would deem it dangerous? Yes. Okay. Councilor Anderson? Yeah, I would, I would deem it dangerous. Um, some of the things that I think Mr. Longstaff shared was the fact that there's no foundation clearly visible that would support the structure. Um, that things appear to be sinking into the earth, which is is clearly not not stable. Um, the fact that there's that well pump extension cord that's directly tied directly into the electrical panel. Um, the fact that it sounds like there's a sewer smell because of improper plumbing, um, and then just clearly the electrical issues that caused the fire. Uh, you know, for those those reasons, it appears to be dangerous. Yeah. I will deem it dangerous. Uh, for me, the most telling piece of evidence was the electrical extension cord directly from the fuse box to the um, to the well. I think that if we're just looking at a fire hazard alone, I think we're asking for another fire. So on that evidence alone, that's my strongest evidence. I'll deem it dangerous. Councilor Hamill? Yes, I also uh, deem the building dangerous based upon uh, the evidence that uh, Brian Longsnap has presented to us uh, threefold. Um, previously mentioned uh, the lack of grounding and the electrical uh, cords that were running from various places, number one, number two, um, a, a number of uh, unsanitary uh, issues associated with plumbing and lack of uh, proper facilities in terms of bathrooms and that sort of thing. And then finally, I think there were uh, a number of uh, an extensive list of structural issues that were identified that render the building unsafe. Thank you, sir. Council Caterina. Yeah, I, I agree that um, the building is dangerous. Um, to add to what everyone else has said, uh, in my opinion, as, as a professional who works in, in real estate and structures and whatever, I was I was just blown away by the mold uh, in that ceiling. Uh, that black mold is dangerous. That's that bad, 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 bad stuff. Uh, it's very hard to mitigate. Um, and I'm, I'm, I feel awful that someone's been living with, with that. This is not good for anyone's health. 
Um, and then, of course, the structural and electric issues are huge. So, thank you, Councilor Johnson. Yes, I have uh, full faith and confidence in our code enforcement uh, assessment. So, I agree this is a dangerous dwelling. We deemed it dangerous, sir. And if I may, I would like to add to get specific, I would ask A, that it is secured immediately. B, make every effort possible to reach out to any possible errors or family members and negotiate with them any sort of solution. C, do not take any sort of demolish action until March 31st of next year, in which case, if anything are to take place, please run it by the council as a whole. And I would like to put that as our directive and I would like to put that to a vote because I think that's significant enough to craft the order. Is that true, sir? That should be sufficient. I just want to clarify that um, after March 31st, 2020, uh, you the council is reserving for the town the authority to demolish the building. If, yep. if we would ask for an we would ask for an update, but we will we would grant them authority after that. Yep. So with that, I, I am going to attempt to move it along. So are there any discussion on what I put forth? An agreement? Yes. We, do we need to take would you like uh, Zach, would you like a formal vote on that or is that enough? Uh, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Do I have a motion? So moved. I guess I made the motion. <laughs> Second. So I have two seconds. Any discussion? With that, Tony? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Next one is resolution 21002. It's an act on the request to approve resolution 21002 uh, re uh, regarding the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Uh, Tom gave us an overview on this. Does anybody have any specific questions on it before we discuss it? No, with that, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? But, Council Kluge? <clears throat> Tom touched on this, but. You know, ideally, this may have gone through finance first, but I, I believe that we were under pressure to actually file the applications that, and, and to accept the funds. Um, so we're under tight deadline. So this is why I believe the town has already made application. We're, we're just reaffirming that, yeah, we want to receive the funds and we're going to find or we'll figure out the, the appropriate use of those funds over the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. Tony? Councilor Pucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody's in the audience for anything previous, you're free to leave. I just, I can pause if anybody would like to leave. Okay. <laughs> I feel like people always feel like they're trapped here once they sit down. So, <laughs> I mean, we are, but. <laughs> Okay, uh, with that, we are on to old business, which is order number 21079. It's the second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section 9, Performance Standards uh, 01, Utility Scale Solar Energy Systems. Uh, I, I think there's probably some members in the public. So anybody in the public like to speak? The podium is here. And I believe there's a couple of Zoom people that would like to speak as well. So I'll defer to the people in the public first, and then I'll go to Zoom. Good evening, Alan Robertson representing Blue Wave Solar uh, here tonight for, for two reasons. One, as we have done already with town council, as well as the ordinance committee, I want to uh, vocalize our support for this ordinance uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I do truly believe as a representative of, of a developer in town that's developing a project, obviously we represent, uh, I'm, I'm speaking in favor of this because I think it's going to accommodate our project, but also as a member of the solar industry for the last decade, I truly believe that the uh, the ordinance and the standards within are going to promote responsible solar development and dissuade irresponsible solar development. So I'd like to continue our vocal uh, our vocalization of support for the ordinance. Uh, secondly, I'd like to, to remind uh, the council, I think of something that colleagues of mine, as well as other supporters of the industry have vocalized previously that due to LD 936 in the most recent legislative session, uh, we need our, our, uh, our municipal permits by the end of the year. Um, uh, by no stretch of the imagination are we asking that you not put the due diligence into this uh, into this ordinance that you would have otherwise, but uh, a vote tonight would be helpful. So I wanted to make myself available if there were any outstanding questions uh, as both a representative Blue Wave uh, and the project in town, as well as, again, uh, a member of the solar committee for the last 10 years. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Any others in the audience like to speak? 
None? Anybody on Zoom like to speak? Oops. Nicholas, you're, you are up, sir. Yes. Can you hear it? You can, I think I faintly hear him. Can you try again? This microphone's not moving. No. Okay, so okay. why don't we do that? Oh, oh, you there? Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's okay. We got you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll keep this very short. Um, I'd like to thank Blue Wave and for speaking. Um, you've heard from me several times, and I just wanted to thank the council. I really appreciate you understanding the, um, uh, the need for um, speed, if you will, here as we, we have a, a deadline looming at the end of the year. Um, it's, we, we've worked uh, really closely with staff. Um, over the last two years, and I think the town has adopted really prudent standards for development. Um, we look forward to, um, uh, uh, we, we asked the council to, to pass um, on this final vote tonight, and we look forward to moving to the next step, and thank you again. Thank you, sir. Any others? Okay, with that, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? None? Okay. Cody? Oh, Councilor Johnson. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I had read an article about Augusta taking a full blown uh, moratorium on uh, solar farms in that area. That was mainly because of the. Sorry. Yep. That was mainly because of the screening yeah. that uh, for the abutters on the residentials in the streets, it was becoming aesthetically unpleasing. So I got a hold of our. Uh, Town Planner Jay and he informed me and I went back and read the zoning and I actually think we do accommodate that screening adequately in our in our enhancement on this performance. So I su I'm gonna support this. Any others? No, I said this at the last meeting. First, uh, Councilor Johnson, thank you for helping me. I think you walked me through this, I think from the very beginning, because I know you were not initially uh, super excited about this. So I, I think the fact that you came around and Jay, the way you illustrated where they would be and where they can't be and where they most likely mm -hmm. won't be uh, was ex very helpful. So thank you for that as well. Uh, so with that, Tody, you want to call the vote? Councilor Pucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Caterina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Chairman Johnson? Yes. yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Jay, can you go home now? Is that it? <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, I heard. I heard. Yeah. Okay. Order number 21081 is the second reading on the proposed amendment, uh, men chapter 302A, committees and boards manual by adding, quote, broadcasting of meetings. This is brought to assistant town manager, which is kind of a lie. It's me forcing the assistant town manager to bring this. <laughs> so, so I'll take the liberty of teeing this up. Uh, essentially, for a very long time, actually, since I've been elected, we've talked about trying to get a better archive of the meetings of the bigger, more substantial committees, not some of the smaller ones that, you know, working committees, so to speak. We don't need working committees to always have a spotlight. But there are some committees in town that we should have a video archive of all of these. And somewhere along the line, once COVID hit, we mistook hybrid meetings for video archives, right? So in, for instance, just now, just because this meeting is hybrid and you're in home at Zoom, doesn't mean I have to record this and archive it. It just means that people have to participate, can have the option of participating remotely. So this was uh, brought forth and it still is in the charter committee's report out. I don't frankly believe it belongs in the charter. I think it's much better as a policy or yeah, policy, right? So this was just a way of ripping the Band-Aid off, getting this done once and for all. And essentially it's going to require all the quote major committees to record their meetings and then be available and archived primarily on YouTube because it's a pretty user-friendly platform. So with that, uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. And any discussion? 
Council Hamill. Yeah, I'd like to thank the chair for uh, recognizing this as a candidate for a fast pass rather than running it through the uh, the charter process. Councillor Clucci. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, in addition to, to you, Paul, uh, Councillor Gleistein, uh, yep. former Councillor yep. Gleistein yep. credit, this is something that she um, you know, was a pretty good, big advocate for in a number of different venues, both rules and policies and on the Charter Commission. So uh, she helped to move the needle on this. I think we all uh, will find out soon if we all see that, that there's some value to uh, having an archive available. Yep. Good. With that, I think. Tony? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Canarino? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Councilor Chairman Johnson? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 21088 is a second reading to approve the expenditure in the amount not to exceed $200,000 from the Land Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing, purchasing the so called Libby, Liberty. Libby property located more specifically identified by the Scarborough Tax Assessor's Maps, Map R. 54, lot 23, as rec recommended by the Parks and Conservation Land Board, and authorize the town manager to execute any and all documents as necessary to protect the town's interest. With that, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak? Seeing none. Is there? Was there? Oh, I'm sorry. Jeremy, did you want to speak? I'm casual tonight. Mr. Winterstein, sorry. You are up. Sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Oh, uh, no, I'm I'm all set. I'm he, um, just representing the land trust in case anyone has any questions, and um, that's uh, that's all I have. So I okay. just want to say hello and um, here here to answer questions. Well, thanks for saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was leaving, so I uh, can't get a motion. So moved. Second. Good discussion. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, I I firmly support this. I, I think that, you know, as the town grows, we need to be very, um, oh, what's the word I want? Focused on areas that we wish to preserve. Um, and I think that this makes a lot of sense. And I hope that we continue to look at other parcels to preserve also. I know one of the things I believe they've been looking at is the corridor of the Nunsuch River. Yeah. as an entirety to the looking at what we can do with that but that's you know another subject so thank you any others no i'll just echo that i thought the presentation a couple weeks ago was awesome very informative i also i think you know there's a ton of groups and boards out there that aren't the council that are doing a ton of work and frankly produce better stuff than we do half the time and this is a good example of it so i fully support this i think it's a steal at a two hundred thousand dollars and it's a great initiative so mm -hmm. that's where i am uh tody you want to call the vote Councilor Cucci? yes Councilor anderson yes Councilor yes Councilor yes. johnson yes Councilor Hamill. yes Chairman Johnson. yes thank you that's unanimous. thank you order number 21091 is an act on the request to authorize delegate and direct town manager to enter into the termination of an agreement with wex incorporated in substantially the form presented here too such the termination agreement having the effect of terminating the credit enhancement agreement between the parties dated april 10th 2020 seems just like yesterday and that was meant <laughs> that was meant to relate to the headquarters facility of wex incorporated has previously planned to develop developed within the Scarborough Omnibus TIF district, but is no longer pursuing. Uh, Tom, do you want to, I can tee this up. Yep, just give you the break. Uh, the long and the short of it is, is about a year and a half ago, we voted to enter into a credit enhancement agreement with WEX. I think it's been very well publicized that WEX is not coming in, at least certainly not in the form they were expecting to, who knows what happens in the future. But as a housekeeping matter, it made sense to revoke the town manager's authority in this case. Because uh, there's, it's in nobody's benefit to have a lingering CEA out there. So uh, the CEA, if, if for the public, was never signed. Uh, it was never signed because the lease, WEX never signed a lease, and the I believe one of the whereas clauses was that they had to start with a building permit. So nothing was ever executed. So all we're doing here is removing Tom's authority to execute that. So. And just uh, I'd further add that I did have direct conversations with WEX and the developers, so they're aware of this. WEX was involved and approved the termination agreement here. Uh, so we left on, on good terms and uh, essentially I said if you would we, love to have further conversation, we appreciate it will be likely a very different project and we'll potentially have a different conversation at that time. So yep. we left on very good terms. Good. With that, I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? Council, oh, Council Hammer. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, 
Yeah, I, this is a good example, I think, of where, uh, you know, we're, a lot of times we're excited about beginnings, but not so careful about, you know, wrapping things up when they finish. So this was a good catch and good administrative discipline. And I think that, you know, something that's uh, actually good for both of the parties. So, yep. Any others? Councilor Kochi? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to see Wex come to town still, but, uh, you know, the fact is the project that they proposed to us when we entered into this agreement or authorization isn't happening. So I think it's appropriate to, you know, to close that door so we can move on to new ventures. That's, uh, that's all. Okay. Any others? With that, Tony? Councilor Gucci? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Mr. Chairman Johnson? Yes. That was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. No, item number nine is non action items. None? All right, item yeah, number 10. Could I, could I just ask a procedural question? I had to step out and, yeah. and the, the town planner just asked a question. With regard to the utility scale solar, there was a, a potential amendment that was included in the packet. It had to do with fences on capital landfills. And oh. I just asked for clarification as to whether or not that amendment was part of your action this evening. Oh, yeah, and, we need to do that. But we're on item number 10, standing a special committee. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's even possible or whether you'd entertain it, much less if it's procedurally possible to entertain that. Uh, there's there's a practical impossibility. Okay, well, let's, it, Tody. But oh, that's yeah, gonna put them. To okay, yeah. I beg your pardon. Is, is that gonna put the the deadline in jeopardy for? I guess it wouldn't because we're approving this and then we're just going to amend what we approved. So yeah. I guess it'd still be fine. Yes. So we'll thank you for that. Indulgence. Well, and I apologize. We didn't, yep. I think collectively we didn't catch it. So <laughs> I forgot to. Yep. Sorry, yeah. Jane. <laughs> he was making me nervous while the note was posting. I thought I know, it was like, an, I'm like uh -oh. I thought really? it was an emergency. <laughs> I find out it's about fences on landfills. <laughs> <laughs> Really on our game tonight, <laughs> catching everything. Yeah. So um, I guess point of order: Are we able to reconsider that vote? Because I, I see it is in our packet. Nobody offered it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say that was an oversight. <laughs> on yeah, I think technically the, the charter requires reconsideration done at the at the meeting immediately following the meeting where action was taken. So is this call, is this actually reconsidering? Would this be? I don't. Is this, that the? This it, would would this Unless be a definition? Start a whole other ordinance amendment process, which no. I don't. Yeah, no, we don't. Want that. Right. Okay. And I, I think it should be fine. They they got their big approval. Uh, this is just a technicality for one okay. of the installations. Well, don't let it happen again, Jay. Okay. So <laughs> there and don't do it so dramatically, like they think. <laughs> He's, he's just trying to show us he misses nothing, even when he's shorthanded with staff. I thought there was a mob of people at the parking lot. I thought I was going to have to go out the back door or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're on standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Are there any? Any? Council Anderson. Yeah, I would just say um, this week at Rules and Policies, we talked about the valuation policy, and I think that'll be coming forward soon to the council for, for review. Any uh, Council Kuti? I, I will be traveling next week. So uh, the regularly scheduled finance committee meeting has been postponed to November 10th, um, where our focus of discussion will be the Haggis Parkway tip. That's right. Councilor Katarina. Yeah, ordinance, we will meet tomorrow. It won't be for very long. Um, we were going to talk about 5G, but because of staff limitations and whatever temporarily now, we're gonna push it back again. So we're just gonna have a discussion about um, what may be next, fireworks, good neighbor ordinance are two of the things. So it'll basically be just a discussion, just so people will know. Any others? Council Hamill? Yes, I'd, I'd like as a first notice to uh, read several recommendations from the uh, appointments committee. We met on Monday and these are for um, appointments to various committees for uh, the council's approval. This is just a first notice. Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee move Darren Granada from first alternate to a full voting member, term to expire 2023, and move Alfred Falzone to first alternate with a term to expire 2022. Planning board, appoint Karen Shoup as first alternate with a term to expire 2024, and appoint Chad Reed as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2022. 
Shellfish Conservation Commission moved Noah Nigren from first alternate to full voting member with a term to expire in 2022 and appoint Darren Granada as first alternate with a term to expire in 2022. Zoning Board of Appeals appoint Christine Snow as full voting member with a term to expire in 2024 and appoint Michelle Stevenson as first alternate with a term to expire in 2023. And uh, we will have a, a second reading on this and a, and a vote to confirm them at the next uh, town council meeting. Thank you, sir. Any others? No, uh, I have two quick things. One, leadership met for a half hour today over Zoom just to go over this agenda. So we talked about uh, nothing new. I do think the uh, Mudgee Road project has officially applied for a contract zone. So I think that's important to mention. Is that correct? They have officially replied? Uh, apply jay did receive one uh, oh that's right and they have to incomplete yeah and they're yep. working on completeness okay. at this okay. point so it's eminent yeah yes it's eminent okay uh and then the only other thing i have is i had a call from the state uh the secretary of state uh at the state level on friday i, I got a uh, we touched base today essentially um our district rep for what district is that the, what district seven. right it's just the small part of Scarborough yeah. where I live that kind of dips yeah. down by the Nonsuch River and back up and includes yeah. most uh, half of Gorham. So there's a vacancy there. The 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 rep resign resigned effective immediately. So the state is asking us to ask them to hold a special election, which would be they would prefer it to be in January. I think that's our decision to be made. I've tasked our town clerk just to call somebody up there, help clarify it. But expect on the next agenda. That we'll at least be discussing if we'd have a special election in January for that district's representative, which again is that small sliver of Scarborough. That me and Jean Marie are the only two people that live there, and then most of Gorham. So, <laughs> uh, with that, any councilor comments? <laughs> it's like eight of us. <laughs> is it? Yeah. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? I threw everybody off. All right, we're adjourned.